reflection on the legacy of Pope Benedict Emeritus, the 16th pontificate. As you will see from your uh, the handout, if you haven't gotten one, uh, please raise your hand and we can make sure you have one. There's a sheet that is being handed out. Uh, Mr. Candela is the director of music here, as I've just indicated. And he has worked for over 20 years as a pastoral musician in a broad range of parish, cathedral, and seminary academic venues. In Washington, D.C., Christopher served as assistant organist at the Cathedral of St. Matthew, the Apostle, and assisted at the Basilica of the National Shrine of the Immaculate Conception as organist, cantor, and composer. And for a decade, he served as director of music for the National Conference of Catholic Bishops plenary sessions, where he developed a deep love of the sacred liturgy of Eastern and Western Catholic rites. In 1995, 1995 he was awarded the Justine Bayard Ward uh, Scholarship for studies in organ performance at the Catholic University of America. His teachers have included Leo Nestor, Edward Moore, Robert Brogan, Theodore Marie, and Elizabeth Daniels. And before I invite Mr. Candela to come up, I invite our pastor, Father Kevin Madigan, to lead us in an opening prayer. Father Madigan. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Almighty God, we give you thanks and reveal yourself to us in word and sacrament in creation, in the work of human hands. Enlighten us this evening that we may grow in our appreciation of you, and love of you as well. You are the source of all that is good and true and beautiful. This we ask to Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Father Manning. And what I forgot to add, Christopher is a native of Derry, New Hampshire. Anyone here from New Hampshire? Uh, he's a liturgist, an artist, and a student of the writings of Pope Benedict Emeritus. Christopher Candela. I was in total agreement with his detractors. 
Okay, confession time. Put on your purple stoles. Ready? I cried the day Benedict was elected. Bad cry. Upset. Really upset. At that time, uh, the only information about Joseph Ratzinger that many of us knew was a total caricature. Mostly playing into long since worn out stereotypes and his recent job as the doctrinal watchdog. I had the fear that he wouldn't know how to be a pastor, a father. And as a convert myself, and as involved Catholic in both professional and personal ways, uh, I had to get to the bottom of this. So, I heard that he'd written a few things, to make an understatement. Um, and I started with the subject that was closest to me, which was the spirit of the liturgy. It's his monumental work, uh, as, as Ratzinger. Suffice to say, I was riveted from cover to cover, the sheer scope and poetry of his writing style, uh, his, his biblical exegesis throughout, the clarity of his writing style, incredible. Reading his particular way of synthesizing history, philosophy, uh, theology, anthropology, it was like hearing a Brahms symphony, really. Uh, and so for me personally, this talk as a way of celebrating a personal evolution, my evolution on, on him, um, and I think many of our evolution uh, over that period of time. So Nicola Vox, Monsignor Vox, in his book about Benedict's reforms, extends an invitation to us. He says, Liturgy is just this, a dispensation, a providential intervention, that is, God's coming among us. Providential because it continually heals us and saves us. That is why it is sacred. To understand all this, we invite the curious non-believers and the adult Catholics, the seekers of truth, and the simple faithful, the emotive liturgists, and the rational ones, uh, humbly to let themselves be guided by Benedict. I extend the same invitation to you. So let's start at the beginning of the, of, of the picture of uh, the situation we found ourselves in. Just as the Second Vatican Council itself, uh, Benedict, the Council's honor student, starts over and over again with the liturgy. The Council started with the liturgy, Benedict starts with the liturgy. He begins with our encounter with beauty, small b and capital B. Small b because beauty uh, is also for us as creatures, us, nature, created universe, seen and unseen, and capital B as the creator, God himself as he is in all his truth. Liturgy is the time and place of this mutual encounter, a relationship between, if you will, these two beauties. We as community can be beautiful, our art, our music, it all has the potential to be a thing of particular beauty. But beauty with a capital B, that is God who is love and truth, is and must be beautiful. Otherwise, full beauty doesn't exist anywhere. So to begin our discussion of Benedict and his teachings on beauty and to understand the situation in which serious-minded musicians and artists and liturgists found themselves, ourselves, in the decades preceding Benedict's papacy, we need to understand the Second Vatican Council and we need to understand the climate in the wake of these more visible reforms that we're all very familiar with, such as aspects of the Mass and the vernacular and a new rite, Mass, as they say, facing the people, uh, a renewed commitment to ecumenical dialogue, uh, return to study of the early church fathers. All of these things have been building steam for decades and arguably even a century prior. The euphoria of the arrival of the reform produced a series of accompanying pressures, uh, which many have said that possibly stretched our outer limits to really absorb the, the reform in all of its wonderful truth. As Monsignor Bucks says, the liturgy, let us be clear, is always in need of reform because worship must always return to the sacred, that is, to the relationship with the transcendent God who has become incarnate. Reform, even in the liturgy, was and is a very good thing. Rightly, the council saw the need to return to basics. In fact, the entire history of councils and papal legislation, I have a big book over here from the year 94 AD, all about papal legislation on sacred music, 
is a continual pruning. Uh, it's an invitation of returning, pruning, coming back. However, from the standpoint of musicians, this pruning took a pretty dramatic form, where the pruning itself, the means, seemed to suddenly become the goal, rather than the actual end of the pruning, which was to create a healthier blossom. Uh, so this isn't an indictment of the beautiful and praiseworthy enthusiasm of the council or those who were rightly swept up in it. What was intended was to be a cross-cultural irrigation between the church and the cultures of the world. The new springtime of the liturgy turned somehow in many places as its calling card to be a real impoverishment of beauty. What some saw as a noble effort to rid the church's public celebrations of centuries of obscure ritual accretions now became a mandate to suspect anything of beauty and genuine value as being out of line with the spirit and mission of the council. We were instructed, or it was implied by well-meaning pastors and teachers, that we must strive toward the lowest common denominator in our art, architecture, and music as a means of imitating what some proposed was an image of the early church before all of these accretions of history. So this would be the academic argument. And also that the liturgy needed to start afresh by resembling the here and now, the people of today. And that's the pastoral argument. The simple marching orders were for reflection on the early church and a sincere pastoral outreach. Both of these are truly noble causes, were and are. In practice, this resulted in a kind of academic missionary rigidity that probably would have shocked even the most hardline preconciliar rubricists. So, let me share a little bit about my own first experiences. I was well schooled in this style of missionary rigidity. And because I loved my newly adopted Catholic faith and I loved music, I joined a folk group at my local parish. Does that surprise anyone here? <laughs> Uh, in the 80s and 90s, folk groups were the epicenter of parish musical life. They were a wonderful community of friends with a common goal. So this being the case, I continued to long for a different kind of music, the kind that I was lucky enough to have heard and experienced as a young child in my grandmother's parish in Massachusetts. It was the result of a true school of cantor of a choir school founded by Nina and David Bergeron. It was on the model of Dr. Theodore Marier's Great Boston Archdiocesan Choir School. And it seemed the two models were so different. I heard as a child, what I heard as a child seemed suspiciously like an old model. Uh, and so my affection for things I heard as a child became a guilty pleasure uh, rather, than, uh, rather than what was being put forward as the, the morally laudable rubric. So this complex weaving uh, back and forth uh, between these two things, we have, uh, you know, laudable things on both sides. And I would say the complex sounds of Palestrina and the ponderous, ponderous undulations of chant in a distant language, the soaring soprano descant of Dr. Maria Gloria uh, never left my eight-year-old ears. But this, I was taught, was not pastoral music, not music of the people. But if I wanted it, where could I find it? You know, just for pleasure. Um, nowhere, because about a decade later, the new administration of my grandmother's church closed the choir school. In fact, it was a parish school that closed the, the whole school uh, for any number of reasons. So this isn't a judgment on the school, it was just the situation. Nina and David left Holy Rosary, and Dr. Marie's incredible, masterful hymnal was piled into the corner of the church. Incidentally, my grandmother, really liked the new music she heard after that. It was a totally different kind of music. She just kept saying, well, it's not the same, but it's nice. People seem to like it. Okay. So in my wonderful Franciscan parish in Derry, New Hampshire, which uh, Louisa mentioned, I had the opportunity many times to really experience prayer uh, in a way that I never did as a child. And as we come into our teenage years, we start to adopt things on our own. I think we start to carve out voice, I guess. Uh, the friars prayed office daily in the church, morning and evening. Fifteen to twenty people joined them based on the psalms. This was a real school for the soul. It was simply done, just spoken, no elaborate music, um, but really school, school for the soul, I, I think in every, every sense. 
On Sundays, I enjoyed participating in the folk group because I get to stretch my legs musically, adding my own little flourishes and electronic, uh, on the electronic keyboard they gave me to play. I got some smiles, I got some praise, I was having some fun, I was appeal appealing to, quote, the people, and I was taught helping the church shed accretions. So the next great hallmark of a good celebration after the council was one that encouraged, quote, active participation. The Second Vatican Council gave us this wonderful phrase, participatio actuosa. I remember well what I thought it meant from a musical standpoint in Derry, New Hampshire. It wasn't the guilty private pleasure of a sorry desk cant. It was that everybody had to sing. Incidentally, I still love it when everybody sings. <laughs> uh, what happens when the instruments of participation are music, our symbols, our actions, what if they're poorly arranged, wrongly oriented, insensitively executed, misunderstood, incongruent with their own historic origin, or worse, deliberately oriented towards something wholly other than God? At best, the congregation, in complete absence of beautiful excesses that were once thought to be accretions, is simply bored. At worst, we are soothingly oriented toward falsehood. So let's explore the concept of participatio actuosa with Benedict. This is what Benedict says. To express one of its main ideas for the shaping of the liturgy, the Second Vatican Council gave us the phrase participatio actuosa, the active participation of everyone in what happens in the worship of God. It was right to do so. The word liturgy speaks to us of a common service and thus has a, rever a reference to the whole holy people of God. But what does this active participation come down to? What does it mean that we have to do? Unfortunately, the word was very quickly misunderstood to mean something external, entailing a need for general activity, as if as many people as possible should be visibly engaged in action. However, the word participation refers to a principal action in which everyone has a part. And so if we want to discover the kind of doing that active participation involves, we need, first of all, to determine what this central actio is in which all the members of the community are supposed to participate. So, you can imagine, after having this battle for years between what I thought were irreconcilable models, I was transfixed. I said, oh, okay, someone's talking to me here. And here, Benedict arrives at his priority for us to consider, to understand what is the central action or activity in which we must partake. The central act is none other than the action of Christ, says Benedict. The liturgy, remember, is a place of relationship. Establishing a relationship does indeed require action, a meeting of the imperfect with the perfect. The action of us, yes, taking in our best and imperfect part in the actio Christi, the action of Christ, alive and dynamic in his self. But first and foremost, and above all, the action of Christ. Because he is for us Christians, the Logos. It's a concept lovingly adopted from the Greeks and from Greek philosophy, which makes so much sense to us and to the first Christians. To understand all truth and beauty, Benedict has us do a little house cleaning of our priorities. Any musician who improvises knows that where you start determines in large part where you end. Right, Mark? <laughs> Uh, Benedict's mission for the liturgy and his reforms and teachings are sometimes misunderstood as seeking to turn back the clock. So where do we start? Have we been understanding the console in the wrong way all along? So there's a complaint that perhaps this was against the communitarian or communal meal dimension of worship, there, that they were somehow polar opposites. Benedict seeks to build our understanding and our lived experience, drawing not just on Christian antiquity, but the whole of Christian life from the day Mary Magdalene first preached his resurrection to the very moment of our sitting here today and everything in between. He teaches us that the meal and the community are very important as they are the visible signs of our relationship. 
a meal that would not have meant anything unless we had first been invited. First with Jesus sitting at the table saying, take, eat. Benedict reminds us, however, that the meal wasn't our idea. It didn't arise from us, nor does it return to us, nor does it have us and all our finitude as its end. I love that word, finitude, a friend of mine gave me that word. It started with him in the beginning and will return to him in the end. Let's begin, as Benedict does, with the Logos. The Logos is the Word, the Word that was present in the beginning. Christ was the Logos, the Word made flesh. The Mass celebrate, celebrates the enfleshment of this Word. Words matter, they carry meaning. The Word, Logos, really matters because it carries the very person in whom is found all meaning. In our aspiring to know the source of all meaning, this Logos, we seek truth. We want to know the truth about God and the truth about ourselves. Beyond that, we want to know truth itself. We want to experience the person who is truth, the person who is beauty, the person who is Logos. But why do we need great music and great art to do this? Why do we need public worship at all? Benedict speaks to us. Is the whole world not now his sanctuary? Is sanctity not to be practiced by living one's daily life in the right way? Is our divine worship not a matter of being loving people in our daily life? Is that not how we become like God and so draw near to the true sacrifice? Can the sacral be anything other than imitating Christ in the simple patience of daily life? Can there be anything holier? I mean, can there be any holy time than the time for practicing love of neighbor whenever and wherever circumstances of our life demand it? Whoever asks questions like this touches on a crucial dimension of the Christian understanding of worship, but overlooks something essential about the permanent limits of our human existence in this world, overlooks the not yet that is part of Christian existence, as if new heaven and new earth had already come. That's Benedict. A liturgy that doesn't foster every possible means of moving us from this not yet to new earth, as Benedict says, has lost its way and is no longer a destination at all. It seeks to erase the uncomfortable idea that we are in fact sitting here in dire need. Benedict goes on. Children's play seems in many ways a kind of anticipation of life, a rehearsal for later life without its burdens or gravity. On this analogy, the liturgy would be a reminder that we are all children, or should be children, in relation to that true life toward which we yearn to go. The liturgy would be a kind of anticipation, a rehearsal, a prelude for the life to come, for eternal life, which St. Augustine describes by contrast with life in this world as a fabric woven no longer of exigency and need, but of freedom and generosity and gift. The rear guard of culture. Here we get some fun stuff. Benedict has very comforting words for us musicians. And I, in deference to anyone here who is an a, a artist or a painter or a visual musician, that's not my uh, field, but do your best, uh, please, to try to uh, take in some of this wisdom as well. There's no reason at all to be discouraged. The great cultural tradition of the faith is home to a presence of immense power. What in museums is only a monument from the past, an occasion for mere nostalgic admiration, is constantly made present in the liturgy in all its freshness. But the present day, too, is not condemned to silence where the faith is concerned. Anyone who looks carefully will see that even in our own times, important works of art inspired by faith have been produced and are being produced in visual art as well as in music and indeed in literature. Today too, joy in the Lord and contrast and, and contact with his presence in the liturgy has an inexhaustible power of inspiration. The artists who take this task upon themselves need not regard themselves as the rear guard of culture. <sighs> Thank you. Any musician trained in the practical science of sacred music who has searched for Catholic church jobs in the decades that followed the council might find a job description that might read something like the following. 
and you know that this is true, those of you who have searched for God. Large parish is seeking an enthusiastic individual to direct a vibrant music ministry. Responsibilities include serving as keyboardist for eight Sunday masses, directing a traditional choir, contemporary choir, folk group, Spanish choir, Filipino choir, children's choir, young adult mass, and the greatest generation mass, and training cantors and supervising an adult uh, enthusiastic worship team. The successful pastoral musician will execute, uh, execute blended worship in the spirit of Vatican II. <laughs> Not only a bit confusing, but exhausting. Oh, by the way, the job is part-time. <laughs> <laughs> Most of us who spend years honing a multidisciplinary multi multi uh, craft are really wondering just one thing about all of this as we skim this job description. Will I be allowed to do what I've been trained to do? The answer by and large in the United States for the past five decades has been probably not, well, at least, not entirely, not without the permission of a committee. Various committees, liturgy committees, worship teams, music committees, they became places not so much for collaboration among the parish's best equipped minds seeking to serve, but rather became instruments of democracy representing the needs and desires of the entire parish. So what happened to those skilled in the sacred and liturgical arts? We now became students, at best, of an unnamed collective with ever-shifting needs Valid leads. Valid leads. There are some good aspects to this, actually. The personal concept of humble service to everyone, not being allowed to dwell in some ivory tower of our own making. Many of us enjoyed that challenge and should never forget its importance. But a more critical issue arose here. Had, re had well-meaning pastors and uh, uh, other leaders determined ultimately and unwittingly that highly skilled artists were no longer needed. Was the only requirement of our new job not skill, but rather a mere willingness to constantly gauge the ever-shifting needs, tastes, and desires of the collective, aka the final and ultimate authority, uh, aka the people. So you can see how these wonderful words started to gain difficult meanings. You might say, well, isn't it true of musicians in any sport? If you don't satisfy the audience, they don't come. Precisely. The temple had now become a theater. Be it a theater of folk music, or highly polished classical music, or no music at all. The end was now to satisfy what Benedict via Augustine calls exigency and need. So here we find the heart of the crisis of the sacred musician as it unfolded. Those skills that were so close to our heart and once so close to the heart of the church had become superfluous as they appeared to no longer fulfill a need. There's a kind of new temptation that now entered for those of us whom the great hymn that you find in the back of your aids there called Spirits Seeking Light and Beauty. The temptation was now to attempt to manipulate the needs and manipulate people, people in a parish as a first goal, separating them into groups of others with like needs, ultimately so that we as musicians weren't rendered irrelevant. The primary goal became determining and serving ethos of subjectivity, modality, rather than the logos of reality. Each mass now had its own style, its own ethos, that is to say, uh, and as Benedict says, whatever, quote, sprung up from our imagination that could fulfill this sense of exigency, this need. Golden calves that rightly express our need for God, but also ultimately become the object of our desire. Benedict astutely observes here, the cult conducted by the high priest Aaron is not meant to serve any of the false gods of the heathen. The apostasy is more subtle. There's no obvious turning away from God to false gods. Outwardly, the people remain completely attached to the same God. They want to glorify the God who led Israel out of Egypt and believe that they may very properly represent his mysterious power in the image of a bull calf. Everything seems to be in order. Presumably, even the ritual is in complete conformity to the rubrics. And yet, it is a falling away from the worship of God. They want to bring him down into their own world and to what they can see and understand. Worship is no longer going up to God, but drawing God down into one's world. 
He must be there when he is needed, and he must be the kind of God that is needed. Man is using God, and in reality, even if it is not outwardly discernible, he's placing himself above God. Worship becomes a feast that the community gives itself, a festival of self-affirmation, a closed circle in on a, a circle closed in on itself, eating, drinking, and making merry. I see this as being far from a negative view of the communal dimension of worship. It's a distinction. Benedict is very skilled at making distinctions. This appealing to fulfilling need is natural and a confirmation of where we really stand before God. But at what point, oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, at the point where what we believe is satisfied, or um, that we believe that we are fully satisfied, the need ends, and so the relationship ends. Why subject ourselves to the rigors of struggling to create art and music that seeks to honor the logos when all our apparent and immediate needs are satisfied by the custom-tailored ethos, an ethos which is now at the center. So in fact, my needs have now been met by one of my parish's many need-tailored masses which are congruent with my particular ethos. More simply put, why share a meal with people I dislike? Why subject myself to a program that demands too much of me? If you would allow me, I'd like to dig into the nitty gritty here. Let's take a look at what this all means for real music. What's the real issue with beauty that Benedict is helping us to confront here? Isn't it simply a matter of taste and style whether someone has an authentic experience with God in a particular piece of music? Of course, God is neither fully contained in our best efforts, nor fully obscured by our worst efforts. But if we believe in the Logos, we believe words matter. And in his book, Morals and Music, uh, Father Basil Cole, who some of you may be familiar with, uh, Dominican, down in Washington, D.C., and an accomplished musician himself, actually, he examines the incredible implication of rhythm, harmony, tempo, and words upon the orientation of the listener. So here, I'm going to have to apologize in advance to anyone who loves this piece of music. I'm about to make an example of it, in cherry. This is the setting of Psalm 23. Some of you have come to know this fairly well. that beyond is on a strong beat 
we observe that my wants and my needs each occur on strong beats with an added length for emphasis. So rubrically correct, since it's based on a song, and definitely permissible, but I would suggest possibly undesirable. By contrast, I'd like to give you an example by uh, our colleague Jeffrey Smith, uh, whom some of you are familiar with, which I feel allows the words of scripture to speak in their own properly oriented text with the adornment of music that internally expresses the longing and desire, the same longing and desire sought by the previous composer, but perhaps without building a golden calf.
Real liturgy implies that God responds and reveals how we can worship him in any form. Liturgy includes some kind of institution. It cannot spring from imagination or our own creativity. Then it would remain just a cry in the dark or mere self-affirmation. Liturgy implies a real relationship with another who reveals himself to us and gives our existence a new direction. So now we get to this term that we hear him talk about so often, the hermeneutic of continuity. So now that Benedict has cleaned house a bit, uh, how does he practically go about liberalizing the possibility of great music and great art? How are they relevant for the church? He reminds us that we've been precisely here many times before. Isn't that the beauty of knowing our history? He reminds us of a debate in the early church, which far from being a mere tussle over aesthetics, struck to the very heart and the nature of our church, the question of images. In speaking about the Byzantine problem of iconoclasm, the ultimate solution, relevant then and relevant now, is a new kind of seeing, not the object itself. Benedict reminds us of the biblical account of the road to Emmaus. They have to be led toward a new kind of seeing, in which their eyes are gradually opened from within, to the point where they recognize him afresh and cry out, It is the Lord. Perhaps the most telling episode of all is that of the disciples on the road to Emmaus. He goes on, Now they no longer just see the externals, but the reality that is not apparent to their senses yet shines through their senses. It is the Lord, now alive in a new way. The icon is supposed to be, is supposed to originate from an opening up of the inner senses, from a facilitation of sight that gets beyond the surface of the empirical and perceives Christ, as the, latter, as the later theology of icons puts it, in the light of Tabor. It thus leads one who contemplates it to the point where, through the interior vision that the icon embodies, he beholds, it, he beholds in the sensible that which, though above the sensible, has entered into the sphere of the senses. As Evdokimov says so beautifully, the icon requires a fast from the eyes. A tissue. <laughs> um, Benedict recognizes the artist's oh, thank you. Benedict re recognizes the artist's relevance no longer at the rear guard of culture, but on the front lines as educators responsible for the most elemental social concerns which the church sought to express, in part in the form of enculturation within the liturgy. This first and most fundamental way in which enculturation takes this is Benedict, by the way. The first and most fundamental way in which enculturation takes place is the unfolding of a Christian culture that in all its different dimensions, a culture of cooperation, of social concern, of respect for the poor, of overcoming class differences, of care for the suffering and dying, a, a culture that educates mind and heart in proper cooperation. This kind of authentic enculturation of Christianity then creates culture in the stricter sense of the word. That is, it leads to artistic work that interprets the world anew in the light of God. As the Greeks so rightly saw, culture is, before all else, education. Taking that word in its deepest sense as the inner opening up of man to all his possibilities in which his external abilities are developed in harmony with his gifts. So now I get to get to the part that I've been so excited to share with you. Let's take the example of the Sanctus, a real high point in the drama of the Mass. It was widely understood for some decades uh, after the Council that the Sanctus, or Holy Holy, uh, a real high point of, of the Eucharistic celebration in both rites, was so important that all in the church had to participate vocally. The clergy, the congregation, the choir, this made sense. The practical result, of course, is that every Sanctus written before the reform was now completely at odds with the new rite. Yet, did our ancestors not feel the same sense of duty about this special moment? Did they no longer have anything to say to us? Was it just a case of incompatibility of old wine and new wineskins? Presented with this question, Benedict answers the question and guides us 
through this particular great moment of the Mass. Let me read to you what he said, and then we'll get to the example. My former Münster colleague and friend E.J. Lengling has said, if one understands the Sanctus as an authentic part of the congregation, the celebration of the Mass, then this, is not, this not only leads to compelling conclusions for new musical settings, but also results in vetoes for most of the, most of the Gregorian and for all the polyphonic versions, since they exclude the people from singing and do not take the character of acclamation into account. Benedict answers this rather boldly. First of all, mistrust is always in order when a large part of the living history has to be thrown into the garbage dump of discarded misunderstandings. This is all the more true for the Christian liturgy, which lives from the continuity and inner unity of the history of religious prayer. In fact, the assertion that the acclamatory character can be attended to only by the congregation is completely unfounded. In the entire liturgical tradition of East and West, the preface closes with the reference to the heavenly liturgy and invites the assembled congregation to join in the acclamation of the heavenly choirs. The end of the preface, in particular, has a decisive influence on the iconography of the Maestatis Domini, compared to the biblical bases of the Sanctus in Isaiah 6. There are three new accents in the liturgical text. The scene is no longer the temple in Jerusalem as in Isaiah, but heaven, which opens itself up to the earth, uh, to, to the earth in mystery. For this reason, it is no longer just the seraphim who are exalting, but all the hosts of heaven in whose acclamation the whole church redeemed humanity can, uh, I'm sorry, the whole church redeemed humanity uh, can sing in unison because of Christ, who connects heaven and earth with each other. Finally, from there, the Sanctus has been transferred from the he form to the you form. Heaven and earth are full of your glory. The Hosanna, originally a cry for help, thus becomes a song of praise. Whoever does not pay attention to the mystery, character, and cosmic character of the invitation to sing in unison with the praise of the heavenly choirs has already missed the point of the whole thing. The unison can occur in a variety of ways, and it always has to do with being representative of or standing in for others. The congregation assembled in one place opens into the whole. It also represents those who are absent and unites itself with those who are far and near. If the congregation has a choir that can draw it into cosmic praise and into the open expanse of heaven and earth more powerfully than its own stammering, then the representative, uh, then the representative function of the choir is at this moment particularly appropriate. Through the choir, a greater transparency to the praise of the angels and therefore a more profound interior joining in with their singing are bestowed than a congregation's own acclamation and song would be capable of doing in many places. Does it not do us good before we set off into the center of the mystery to encounter a short time of filled silence in which the choir calms us interiorly, leading each one of us into silent prayer and thus into a union that can only occur on the inside? Must we not relearn this silent inner co praying with each other and with the angels and saints? the living and the dead, and with Christ himself. He concludes all of this beautifully. He says, the way the words of the canon do not become worn out expressions that we then in vain attempt to substitute with ever newly assembled phrases, phrases which conceal the absence of the real inner event of the liturgy, the departure from human speech into being touched by the eternal. Langling's veto which has been repeated by many others, is meaningless. The Choral Sanctus has its justification even after the Second Vatican Council. He goes on to answer the practical concern over the structure of a split Sanctus and Benedictus later on. Uh, but let's have a little something, a little sample of something that has now become possible in places it may not have been possible before. Whereas our more limited reading of rubrics might have prevented such an interior moment as the one I'd like to share, some of you here will be familiar with this contemporary choral sanctus. It's by Yves Castanier, organist of the choir at Notre Dame in Paris.
Singing is a lover's thing. 